Pharaohs and their tombs have long captivated both the scientific and the popular mind. Stories about mummies and their curses have been around for more than a century and populate not just natural history museums, but also horror movies and children's cartoons. Perhaps the most famous Egyptian pharaoh in the world today was King Tutankhamun, or King Tut. The discovery of this relatively unimportant pharaoh's tomb in 1923 included a, a, an impressive array of treasure. The tomb wasn't untouched. There's some evidence that it had been robbed in antiquity, but the, the incredible condition and number of burial items gave the young pharaoh, well, fame beyond all proportion to his relatively short rule. You would think, though, that the discovery of another untouched pharaoh's tomb would be big news, but when archaeologist Pierre Monte discovered not one but three untouched burial chambers just 17 years later, the find went largely unnoticed. The discovery of the silver pharaoh and his treasures became the victim of larger world events. It's history that deserves to be remembered. Jean-Pierre Marie Monte was born in 1885 in villefranche sauson France. After earning his degree, he became the professor of Egyptology at the University of Strasbourg in 1919. He was an archaeologist and conducted his first major excavation at the ancient Byblos, now Jubail, in Lebanon. There he discovered tombs of local rulers contemporary with the Egyptian Middle Kingdom, and what at the time was believed to have been possibly the oldest example of alphabetical writing. In 1929, he began excavating at Tanis, Egypt, the ancient Janet in the northeastern delta of the Nile River. Tanis became the capital of Egypt following the abandonment of the former capital, Pi Ramses. The city had already had two other major excavations in the 19th century. A decade later, Monte made his greatest discovery at Tanis. He found the royal necropolis of the 21st and 22nd dynasties. These two dynasties began at the end of the powerful New Kingdom period after a century of decline. The pharaohs had been ousted from southern Egypt by the powerful high priests of Amun at Thebes and left to rule northern Egypt from the Nile Delta. On February 22, 1939, he discovered a funerary chamber that he identified with the pharaoh Asurkan II. The burial site had been plundered, but he did find the still intact quartzite sarcophagus of Asurkan's son, Takalot II, as well as hundreds of Ushaptis. Ushaptis are small funerary servant figures put in pharaoh's tombs to accompany them into the afterlife. The ancient Egyptians believed that they would be endless work to do in the afterlife, and so the Ushaptis were made to become the workforce for the deceased. They were often inscribed with what kind of work they were meant to do as well as their owner, and the more one had, the richer the deceased. The most simple were crude or made of mud, but those in pharaoh's tombs would often be made of stone, lapis, or even wood. While he was examining and cataloging his finds, the rest of the world was concerned with a very different situation evolving hundreds of miles to the north. On March 15, 1939, Hitler and Nazi Germany invaded Czechoslovakia. It isn't clear if Monte realized that he was now racing against the clock, but he did redouble his efforts to explore the necropolis. After clearing out the first chamber, he found a second, completely untouched chamber. Inscriptions in this chamber mentioned the pharaoh, Susenus I. And at its center sat a brilliant silver sarcophagus with the head of a falcon. It is notable that the coffin was silver. The ancient Egyptians associated gold with the skin of the gods and silver with the gods' bones. But gold was much more abundant. They had no local supplies of silver and could only be imported. Only a few silver coffins had been found. The fine craftsmanship of the casket and the grave goods indicated this wasn't the tomb of a minor leader, but someone who commanded wealth and power. On March 21st, the Egyptian King Farouk came to the site to be present at the opening of the coffin. Inside was a beautiful gold face mask and gold jewelry, but the coffin didn't belong to Susenis. There was some damage to the trough and evidence of plant growth at its edges. This sarcophagus had been moved sometime in antiquity, probably because the former tomb had become waterlogged from being so near the Nile. The moisture from the river had long destroyed any wooden burial items. The symbols on the coffin indicated it belonged to a previously unknown pharaoh, Shoshank II. In fact, his jewelry and funeral items rivaled that of King Tut. Two other highly decayed mummies were also found in this area and have not been positively identified. The obvious question remained, where was Susenis? While well, he continued to excavate, the gears of war ground on. In September, Germany invaded Poland, prompting the United Kingdom and France to declare war on Germany. Monte found several other looted chambers, and finally, on February 15, 1940, found a corridor sealed with a single large slab of granite made from a piece of an obelisk dedicated to Ramses II. 
The Egyptians often recycled portions of older buildings into newer ones. It took six days for Monte's team to chip through the plug. When they finally did, Monte stared through the dark hole at what lay inside, hidden from the world and untouched for millennia. Inside the chamber sat a huge red granite sarcophagus, surrounded by silver and gold cups and bowls, canopic jars which held the removed organs and ushabdis. He would later write that the tomb contained marvels worthy of the Thousand and One Nights. As he explored further, he found a black granite coffin inside the red, and inside that, the silver coffin with gold inlays that held Susenna's himself. Inside the coffin, Susenna's mummy had not survived the wet conditions and had deteriorated to nothing more than black dust and bones, but the brilliant golden mass that would have covered his face remained, as well as jewelry and a golden mummy board. Susenna's tomb remained the only pharaonic tomb discovered, untouched, by any robbing attempts. The granite sarcophagus was discovered to be another recycled item, having belonged to the 19th dynasty pharaoh Merneptah, who had ruled 200 years earlier than the pharaoh it contained. The black granite coffin was also recycled, but its original owner has not been identified. The solid gold mask had lapis lazuli, as well as inlays of white and black glass for the eyes and eyebrows. It has been called one of the masterpieces of the treasures found at Tanis. Susenis was covered in elaborate jewelry, including a brilliant collar of gold and lapis, rings with precious stones on every finger, and the most elaborate finger and toe stalls ever found. He was even wearing gold sandals. The name Susenis is the Greek version of his original Egyptian name, which means the star appearing in the city. His sumptuous burial challenged the idea that the pharaohs of the Third Intermediate Period, after the New Kingdom, were weak and largely powerless. A Ptolemaic source records that Susenis ruled for at least 41 years, but the sources are unclear if it may have been longer. Some experts suggest his rule lasted 46 or even 51 years, starting around 1047 BC. Seen traditionally as a period of serious upheaval, Susenis' rule seems to have represented a period of relative stability. He is known to have led the fortification of the city of Tanis, using granite from the ruins of the abandoned Pi Ramses to build walls in the central part of the great temple at Tanis. Study of the pharaoh's body in 1940 revealed that he had died as an old man with badly worn teeth and abscess in his palate and severe arthritis. The cartouches decoded on his belongings revealed Susenis was also a high priest. He had married one of his daughters to a high priest of Amun who ruled the southern part of Egypt. This marriage partly explains the relatively peace of his rules that seems to have been part of an arrangement that helped him make peace with the de facto rulers of the rest of the kingdom. He did seem to be on good terms with the priests in the south, as they donated several items that were found in the pharaoh's tomb. The reuse of the sarcophagus and granite coffin also imply a peaceful relationship with the south, as the Valley of the Kings they were taken from was part of officially sanctioned looting and lies hundreds of miles outside the region the northern pharaohs controlled. The deliberate choice to include the borrowed items was possibly a ploy to tie his rule and that of his children more closely to the great rulers of the past. Though Susenis represented probably the greatest find in the necropolis, Monte found others nearby. A chamber made for Susenis' wife and sister, Munetmut, was also found. But the sarcophagus inside held the body of Susenis' son and successor, Amenemope. Her body and coffin have not been found. Another coffin, apparently empty, bore the name of a general. It was in April 1940 that Monte searched the tomb of Amenemope, merely a month before Nazi Germany invaded France and the Low Countries. In addition to not being in his own tomb, Amenemope's grave mask was much less detailed than his father's, probably reflecting the decline in the kingdom. Excavation at the site would soon cease for the duration of the war. Realizing he had little time to waste, the treasures he had uncovered were sent to Cairo for safekeeping, and Monte and his family rushed out of the country, hoping to beat the oncoming war. The New York Times reported on the discovery of Susenis in February 1940, but by May the news was preoccupied with the beginning of one of the largest conflicts in human history. Monte published a book on his work at Tanis during the war. The discovery remained obscure, and the finds weren't even displayed to the public until 1944. Pierre Monte persevered through ten years of excavation before he found these pharaoh's tombs. He wrote about his excavations at Tanis in a three-volume work, and continued to work as an Egyptologist, both at the University of Strasbourg and later in Paris. He retired in 1956 and passed away in Paris in 1966. The discovery of Susenna's tomb is one of the most important in the history of Egyptian archaeology. It gave us a much greater understanding of a previously poorly understood period in Egyptian history and brought to light the name of a pharaoh who seems to have ruled well despite instability of the times. And yet today, 70 years later, visitors to the museum in Cairo often walk right by Susenna's to go see the more famous 
Tutankhamun. And that brings to mind the idea of popular history and timing. Whether a historical event becomes popular, well known, is partly impacted by the history of when the history was discovered and might be out of all proportion to any sort of objective measure of historical value. And that tells us that if we just dig a little deeper, we might find much more history that deserves to be remembered.